Hey, y'all, how y'all doing? I hadn't preached in a long time. I got four sermons today, so buckle up. <laughs> hey, listen, I want to tell you, I'm thinking if I was a lay person here, you know what I'd do? I'd come to a service, and then I'd go to a class, and then I would serve somewhere. I'd either come and serve early, then go to a service, then go go to a class or vice versa. I'd figure it out. Because I, I think that that is such a minor thing. You know, we... It, everybody ought to serve. I mean, if you're full of God, if you're devoted to God, don't you want to both serve and give? I don't understand people who say they're following God, they live living for eternity, they're headed to heaven, they got Jesus in their heart, they're saved, they're forgiven, and they don't want to give and they don't want to serve. See, you don't just give money and give your way out of serving. You know, and so I'm just telling you, everybody ought to serve somewhere. And we got a couple of places over there now that I think of that. Uh, set you up. Oh, we're in the, the student campus over the yard. They could use a couple more mowers every other week to mow an hour and a half. How hard can that be? And one of you get to ride a tractor mower. And if you have a wreck, we'll put you on the push mower. But we could use your help. And then, you know, more and more people are coming to church now. They're getting back out here and bringing their kids. We've got all the early childhood kids, and Pastor Ann is going, I could use some more help because some of the people that maybe were helping before aren't quite comfortable because they're 130 years old. They were still conserved, but they don't, you know, maybe they're a little more vulnerable. I don't know. Although some of the oldest people in the church haven't been afraid and never missed one church service the whole time. They're still, they're still a licking and a ticking and a clicking. And I'm going to mention you, Georgine, even though I know you're up, upwards north at Hunter. Actually, Georgine's 98 years old. Georgine, God bless you, girl. Woo. Anyway, I just hope you'll serve, guys. We need to serve and give and be a heart to give. And you know what? I, I was at this training yesterday, this, uh, the, uh, the Will Graham Christian Life, they're out on the information and also the welcome. There's these little brochures and there's training. The best thing, he's coming in October. This is Billy Graham's grandson. How many of you never heard of Billy Graham? Do you know that teenagers don't know who Billy Graham is? That's a shame, isn't it? Parents, grandparents, make sure your kids know. And this guy's Will Graham. He's anointed and it's a community wide thing. And people will go to a community thing that they won't come to a local church. And we can take access. But one of the greatest things they do, Billy Graham years ago developed with Navigators, one of the very best trainings that you would ever find. And there's three sessions. The last three Saturdays in June, it's so two hours, is going to be right here. You're going to get two hours of the best training how to, be, how to disciple someone. I love it that Billy Graham's organization that, that's still going with his son and grandson says this. It says, we're not just here for decisions. We're here to, here to make disciples. And that's what this course is about. It'll help you grow and disciple and learn things and be reminded and help you then take it to someone else. Someone urge you to be a part of that and be praying. October, it's coming to the city of Des Moines. And several of the Graham personnel have come to town. They're living here. They're among us and pastors and things are moving forward. And so uh, that's a good thing. Listen, we're going to start having memory verses on Sunday morning. So you know, you, I know Jeff said turn your phone off because you know what? God inhabits the praise of his people. How do you praise him if you're on your phone? You know, you can't, you got to like set that aside a minute. Now sometimes, sometimes you have to monitor. I get it. Doctor back here, you got to monitor things, you know, keep an eye on things and all that. So there's times you do. But this memory verse here, Ephesians 5.18, you can take a photo of it or write it down. Can we put that up, please? There it is. Uh, and it says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This word, be filled with the Spirit, is a continuous action verb. Continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. It's what you do through disciplines to be full of God. Reading the Word, meditating on the Word, memorizing Scripture, because the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So memorizing verses, this is the one for this week, and simplify it for your early childhood. Just say, be filled with the Spirit. You know, if you got a two-year-old, teach them that. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. And then everybody, learn it. Put it in there. Bring it up. Talk about it. Okay, now listen. We need to do what we can do as devoted sincere followers to stay walk full of the spirit now i can't the, there's this to topic called baptism of the holy spirit jesus the bible says is the baptizer of the spirit i can't baptize myself in the spirit only jesus can just like 
by the Spirit, I can't be born again. The Holy Spirit has to make me born again. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, how can I go back to my mother and be born again? He said, no, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. We're born again by the Spirit. Christ Jesus comes into us as the Holy Spirit puts Jesus in us and changes us. The Spirit of God, the same that raised Jesus from the dead, changes our heart and raises us up, changes our desire. He doesn't leave you going, oh, I really want to sin. I got to sin. I want more sin. You know, no, that's, that's not what it does. That's a decision. Conversion, transformation is by the Spirit of God, by Jesus that changes your heart. Are you with me? And that's the Spirit of God that brings salvation, puts Jesus in our hearts, changes our heart, changes our desire, changes the way we think, changes the what we see, changes how we feel so that it lines up with God in a biblical view, view of the world. Are you with me? But this Holy Spirit thing, to be filled with the Spirit, you can, you have your part <clears throat> and you can, <clears throat> if this is a vessel, you can be, yea, so full, but you're not overflowing. Baptized means to immerse, overflowing, immerse, immersion. The word itself means to immerse, baptize, to immerse. We can read the word, we can pray, we can worship, and we can be full. And we have to do that. Meditate, taking time. The problem is, we're not out sinning as followers of Jesus, but we're not filling ourselves with enough water and word. You see what I'm saying? Now, I, I call the flesh the dirt. My dirt wants to be taken care of. I need a meal, right? How many of you, if you miss one meal, you feel a little hungry or thirsty, huh? How many of you miss all day long, you're going, I'm kind of hangry, I'm, I'm wanting to eat, right? Here, the, you know, there's a prophecy that, I, that really witnessed with me. It says there's a desert, and boy, oh boy, is a world full of a desert. But I've been sensing that there's something about to blow, the wind. And that song, I love it. You know, pour out your spirit. Let the winds blow. Flame the fire. May it burn in us. And let me tell you something. That's my prayer. The spirit of God would pour out. And, uh, and, and I believe that the Lord's about to burst forth on the land in the last days we are living in. And I'm gonna tell you something, we need to be full of the Spirit because we're in a war, you hear me? Ephesians says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, it's against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places, and we need to put the armor of God on. And one of them is prayers, all kinds of prayers. Prayers and worship and breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel so you're prepared. That's what this course is about, to share Jesus in a spirit-led way, in a clear way where people actually have transformation and not just become a decided weak little American quote-unquote Christian that goes to a church and joins a Christian club. That's not transformation. That's not salvation. That's religion. And that's what most of America has. And so most churches are trying to figure out a way to be appealing and they want to avoid truth that cuts. Well, the Bible says the word of God is the sword of the spirit and it cuts. It's like a two-edged sword and it cuts straight in. And we need to be cut by the word and we need to be cut open and filled up and we need to go after God to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness so you shall be what? Filled. Here's the interesting thing about food and spirit. Listen, the more you eat, if you eat, then you're satisfied. You don't want more because you're full. But when you get fed of the Spirit and the Word, you get full of it, guess what? You want more. When you taste and see, you want more. We need to want more of God, more of His Word, more of His Spirit, more of what God wants to do. Let me tell you, if you've only had your toe in the water, I want to push you in the deep end. I mean, like a swimming pool, the, narrow, the shallow end, the little kids are there, and we, we know we don't know how to swim yet, but the fun is when you jump in and go 10 feet under, and you're down under there, and you say, come on in, jump in, don't be afraid. I'm telling you, I want you to dive in deep with God. I want you to be surrounded by His glory, filled with His presence, powered by His Spirit, full of His Word, calling out to God, letting Him flow through you. Let me tell you something. The difference is you can fill yourself up, and you can work for God, and God's powerful in you. But boy, I tell you, when you begin to overflow, it splashes onto people, right? It's like, it just does this, it just water just flows over, flows over. You see, you get saved and you get baptized in water. You get, you get, you can fill yourself with the Spirit and then Jesus baptizes you with the overflow of the Spirit. Are you with me? 
And we're talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit series. Part one last week was the uh, discerning gifts. Discernment, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Last week in the 11 o'clock service, the Lord gave a word of knowledge to one of our people. And we gave it. We said there are people in this service that two of them, they didn't know it was two, but someone that's thinking of taking their life, committing suicide. He said, if that's you, come up here and do this, do that. Two people in that service came and prayed. One of them came to the Lord because God's spirit wants to make the supernatural the norm and not the, not the occasional uh-oh happens. And when we walk full of God, it's so easy when we're right there at the brim to splash over into the supernatural. The natural isn't going to change America. The natural isn't going to, going to get anybody anything but religious knowledge. The supernatural is the power of God that saves us, that fills us, that empowers us, that flows through us and does things that are unexplainable. What I'm going to talk about today is weird, and I thought it was weird too until something happened to me. Anything supernatural is weird. I mean, you think about it, the virgin birth, hello, the Spirit of God coming up on Mary and putting the baby in there, having a birth, huh? You think that's not weird? That's weird. God's saying, let there be light. Poof, there's light. That's a little weird. But that's because the people that don't have eyes of faith, that the Spirit hasn't birthed faith, you're coming from an understanding, intellectual understanding only, and trying to understand it in the intellectual mind, you're never going to get there. It's spiritually discerned. And let me tell you something, God is a powerful God. He's a mighty God, and he's able to do everything. We had a word this morning, and God gave me a word this week. It's for our nation. It's for our church. It's for the you guys walk, listening online today. And I want you to tune your heart and ask God to fill you up and commit yourself today to fill yourself up through prayer and word and three meals a day. See, we, we go without a meal or without drink, and then, you know, we don't think much of it spiritually. But here's the word he gave. He said, we're weak when we don't drink or eat physical food, even after missing one meal, especially a whole day. But how much weaker are we in the spirit when we don't drink of the water of the spirit or feed on the daily bread of God's word? So no wonder we're weak. No wonder we have a low tank level. No wonder we're needing more, more of the spirit to fill us. We've got to go after God. We need three spiritual meals a day. And then that'll give you more and more of a hunger. Are you with me? To close the service, I want us to, those that want to say, I want to see our church experience a mighty, miraculous, amazing move of God where God divinely falls and heals people, where someone is so full of God like Peter, their shadow falls in Acts chapter 5 over someone and they're healed. Or like Peter and John went to pray in Acts chapter 3 and they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ rise up and walk. I want to see God so full in us that the normal is the supernatural. Amen? Because God's gifts are, do not change. God doesn't change. And what he did in the early church, he's still doing today. And there are people that need healing. We have uh, wives and daughters and sons that are very sick and facing dire straits. And I'm believing that God's going to begin to do something mighty, so I'm going to press in and commit myself. Now, in the natural, there's things we can do. The Bible, Jesus said, these things go out but by fasting and prayer. Sometimes it's just say, just fast and pray. And he, he rebuked the disciples for not being devoted enough to fast and to pray to get fuller of God. But there's some things, no matter what we do, we don't get there unless God does it. Like you can't save yourself, no matter how much you read the Bible or memorize the Bible, you can't save yourself. Only the Spirit of God can make you brand new. Are you with me? Only Jesus can save you. And you can't fill yourself with Spirit. Only Jesus can put His Spirit full in you. How many are you talking about an over, a baptized and overflowing in you? So I want to talk today about the next three gifts in, in our text in 1 Corinthians 12. And last week we talked about the first three, they were, they were uh, discerning gifts. <clears throat> Today, they're declarative gifts. First Corinthians 12, if you look there, verse 4 to 11. And I want to tell you the first thing is, as we read the nine gifts in this passage, number one, they're gifts that benefit the body of Christ. They're not for you to benefit you, although there's a blessing in being used. But everyone, all of these have to flow in a way that the body is benefited. All right, and there's important that you distinguish that or otherwise you'll discern scripture wrong and you'll come to a conclusion that's not biblical. 
These gifts benefit the body. Here we go. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible that's the most accurate English version, according to Dr. Wave Nunley, and I believe it, from the original version. There are varieties of ministries, the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There it is. These gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good. For the common good. See it? To benefit everyone. The other versions say it a little differently. To profit with all, one to King James. To profit everybody. Then it talks about the different gifts of the Spirit. These are Holy Spirit gifts. For one, the same Spirit is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. These are Holy Spirit gifts. To another, word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the effect of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing of spiritual with that's discernment. To another, various kinds of tongues, a variety, notice it's various kinds. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills, as He, God, His will determines. In other words, you can't determine, I'm going to use this gift. No, God determines who's going to use it, when it's going to be used, and the gifts are the Spirit gifts, all right? Today, declarative gifts are listed here. They're prophecy, various types of tongues and interpretation of tongues. All of them are for the same purpose. Tongues has to always follow, we'll see in a minute in scripture, interpretation to benefit the body of Christ. Paul makes it very clear. A spiritual language, we don't understand, so it has to be interpreted. So you have the spirit language and interpret, the body benefits. Prophecy is just speaking truth anointed. So when you interpret or prophesy, it's exactly the same thing. Here's what it is. Powerful words from God for an individual, for a moment, for a time, for a group that are quickened and anointed for the moment. I just gave you one that God is exhorting you or urging you. To exhort means to, like a coach. I'm telling you, you gotta do this, that you need to take upon yourselves to quit doing so many things with your time that you're watering down the spiritual thing. It's like, you know, they're not bad things, but we watch too much sports, go to too many concerts, go to the park too much. We do all these things that do nothing for you spiritually. We need to feed ourselves spiritually so that we're built up. We need to understand this is a spiritual war and our nation's in trouble. Our world is in trouble. Our families are in trouble. We need to be powerful, pulling down strongholds in the name of Jesus, full of God, full of faith. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Do y'all want that? At the close here, if you really want that, you want all of God, I'm going to ask you to move here and go, God, come on, just fill me up. I'm, I'm devoted to being full. I'm going to do Ephesians 5.18. I'm going to fill myself daily so I'm, my faith measure goes up. I'm going to start fasting and praying. I'm going to set aside my flesh and my, my, my pleasure life for the spiritual life, for the internal life. Paul gets done here in 12, and then he, in 12, he goes into this body part discourse. Paul talks about the physical body. So he says that we have these nine gifts, and God's Spirit says, here, here, use this one now. Use this one now. Use this one now. And then he says, now listen. He says, we're all the same body. The eye can't say to the ear, you know, the eye has the hear, sees. And if we were all an eye, where would the hearing be? And it even goes down to the toes important. So he uses parts of the body to make this point that each one of you have a, a role, a place, a value to make a difference for eternity in the church, to build each other up, to encourage each other, to exhort one another to minister one to another, to use a very variety of gifts. And we need each other to do that. We need to be yielded. And then he closes out with this and he asks a question. And here's why I'm making the point that these gifts are for the body of Christ. They're to benefit the body of Christ. Because when in verse 27, he'll start off in a minute, he's gonna ask questions. Is everybody this? Is everybody this? Does everybody do this? Does everybody do this? And he's asking the questions about the gifts that benefit the body. Keep that in note. He's asking the questions about gifts 
that benefit the body of Christ. Here's, here he goes, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 12. Now you are Christ's body and individual parts of it. He summarizes that after he gets done with talking about us being eyeballs and ears. <clears throat> and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. In Ephesians 4, there's the five-fold ministry. These three, pastors and evangelists, they're listed. The difference in those, those are five callings that you walk in. You have those. I can't not be a pastor. It's who God made me. I, it doesn't matter if I'm paid here. It doesn't matter where I go. Till I die, I have a pastor's heart. I can't help it, right? You get it? It's a calling. It's who, it's who I am. It's the gift. It's who I am, right? All right? That's, that's, that's those. But he, so he throws them in, talking about how we all have a part. And then he says, then miracles. Now he's talking about these that he mentions in verses 4 to 11, these supernatural gifts, miracles, supernatural, right? Then gifts of healings. And now he talks about other gifts in Romans where he talks about helps and administrations, help ministries, like organizing. I can't organize my way out of a wet paper bag. Never, I don't even try. Administration, I'm not, that's not me. I'm telling you right now, it's ridiculous how bad I am at it. I, don't judge me. You're looking at me awful harsh. Are y'all looking at me on television, harsh or on the computer? Don't be looking at me that way. Are you listening online? How about over there in the mass service? Y'all hearing me? All right, I hope you are. Organization, various kinds of tongues. Notice various kinds, not just one, various kinds. And then he asks the questions, are all apostles, are all, uh, are, are all not apostles rather, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gift of healings, do they? All do not have, do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? When he says speak with tongues and interpret, he's talking about the nine gifts that are to benefit the body. Remember, I told you these are about the body. It's right in the context of the body, of the illustration of the body, all having a point to make a difference all in the body. So when he asks the question, all do not speak with tongues, do they? He's talking about to benefit the body. All do not interpret, do they? He's talking about to benefit the body. That's what it applies to. And then he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts, and yet I'm going to show you a far better way. Let me tell you something. All the gifts benefit the body, and these are no different. But there are some things that God gives us that benefits you, the believer. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. But he goes to chapter 13 in a more excellent way, and that's love. And then people use this verse, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. There's a variety of tongues, men and angels. I mean, angels evidently talk a different language, right? Did you know that I've talked to many a missionary that have told about certain tongues that they've heard and been there, that that language was known by the people in the place. That happened just like Acts 2. We'll read it in a minute. Did you know that Jack Hayford told a story of a guy that the Holy Spirit was upon? You could tell he was just like being touched and just moved by the Spirit. And he was so close to speaking a language. In reality, he was. It was he was making a guttural clicking noise. And a missionary from an Africa, deep woods village came. And he said, oh, he's speaking perfect and whatever it was. Jack Hayford tells that story. You know who he is? One of the greatest men that ever lived. Church on the way. King's, High, King's, King's Castle Castle. Uh, uh, whatever it's called, the, the Bible college. I'm telling you, this stuff is weird as can be. And I thought it was weird too for a long time, but it's not, not real. It's real. And so when it talks about do all speak with tongues, I'm talking about in the church, do all interpret? No. I mean, they don't. You got love. He says, if you do that, you don't have love, it's nothing. He said, in other words, the real thing the Spirit always points back to is your heart's full of love. And then he says, but he doesn't say just speak with tongues. He said, you have all knowledge. You sacrifice and sell everything, give to the poor. No matter what you do, you give, well, no matter what you do, guys, if it's not, if the, if the pure inner side isn't love, it, it's nothing. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. My dad was Southern Baptist. My mom was similar to God. And my dad questioned this speaking in tongues thing. And my mom had done it and had experienced it and tried to explain it. But, you know, if you never have, you just question it. So I was pretty skeptical. 
And one night, the church had been praying for, just like we are, for a fresh wind, for a fullness of God's spirit. And one night, unbeknownst, just a regular night, about 30 of our youth were there. The Holy Spirit, wind blew. It's just like Acts 2, we'll read in a minute. And I mean, all there were filled with the spirit and spoke with tongues. Just exactly like Acts 2, they were all filled with the spirit and spoke with other tongues. All, all of the kids, all the teenagers, I watched it and I was the last one because my dad was skeptical. And I'm standing off watching it and I'm going, hmm, okay. Then I walked over here and I had two of my friends and they're speaking in a tongue and they're doing sign language. And then someone over here goes, hey, they knew sign language. They started interpreting the sign language and they're talking in a tongue. I'm going, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, I don't know, I can't explain it, but I saw it firsthand. And these are my friends that I know, and they're not particularly spiritual, right? All this is going on. And I'm standing back, so I walked over by myself, and I thought, hmm, I don't know about this. I said, but God, if it's real and you, and you want it for me, I, I want anything that's real, I want all of you. And I mean, just like that. I mean, no one coached me. No one's speaking a spiritual language in my ear. No one's trying to tell me how to, I wasn't trying to speak a language. All of a sudden, just like Acts 2, suddenly the spirit wind blew, the fire came and they spoke. I mean, suddenly it was like gushing. Pastor Jeff tells the same story. He just goes, God, if, if, you, if, this, if you want this and if this happens, I'm gonna go, I'm be open to it. I'm just open to it. And he says that it was suddenly, and we both described it this way, gushing just gushed out. Let me tell you something. Not once in the Bible where it says they were baptized in the Spirit and they spoke with other tongues does it say, not one time does it say that the people with them told them what was going to happen. Not once did they say, now here's what happened the first time everybody spoke with tongues so get ready. Let me tell you about tongues. Not once did they give them that but every time they spoke with tongues when the baptism happened. Simon saw it happen. He wanted to buy the gift so he could make, lay hands and make people do that. Simon, he got rebuked, say, you want to make money on what God does supernaturally. Remember that? The Gentiles, it says, they were baptized in the Spirit and they spoke with other tongues. And over and over, to this day, when the outpouring of Azusa Street happened and people spoke with other tongues, and me, the skeptic, God just does it. I'm telling you, you can say all you want, I know it's real. I, you, I don't, I don't, if you, you know, if you never, my dad never experienced it, but he didn't doubt it. He doubted it when my mom had it because my mom wasn't as good a bo- girl as I am a boy. <laughs> he knew her, but my dad knew I wasn't like him. I wasn't going to fake anything. See, see what I'm talking about? And he just came into me. Let me tell you something. These gifts, when the Spirit of God, and you're like, just picture a glass of water, and it's just full. When Jesus baptizes you, it immerses and flows over. All right? And out of that comes miracles. Out of that comes the gifts that flow. Out of that comes a language that flows. It's not your own language. All right? And I just want, my end goal isn't to make everybody speak in tongues. My end goal is for everybody to be full of God. But spiritual language has benefits, and I want to talk to you about that. So, but first, let's look at uh, the purpose of these uh, languages that are, I mean, these uh, uh, gifts that are uh, declarative, that are spoken, the tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says this, Pursue love, yet earnestly you desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. In other words, he's praying. When you speak to God, that's prayer, right? For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. In other words, the spirit is given the language and the tongue and prays a perfect language. He didn't even, I don't even know what I'm praying, but I know God is. Sometimes I don't know how to pray, and the Bible says we can pray. Sometimes we intercede in a spiritual language because there needs to be something broken. And so God knows how to do that because he's given us the prayer through the spirit. Verse 3 says, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation, and or comfort. Those three things right there in verse 3 are what these declarative gifts are for. Prophecy, speaking a word of God meant for a moment to exhort you, to build you up, to push you, or to comfort you, or to console you, or to to, uh, exhort you. All right, so let let me just say, 
Tongues for the benefit of the body has to always be interpreted. And tongues and interpretation is exactly the same thing as prophecy. Because the end goal is that you say something people understand for the purpose of edification, for exhortation, and for comfort. And so Paul quickly says this in verse 4. The one who speaks in tongues edifies himself. There's a benefit. Is it okay to build yourself up? To edify means to build up. Is it okay to edify yourself? Is that, is that wrong? You think Paul is saying it's wrong? I'll tell you in a minute, he's not. But the one who prophesies edifies the church, and that's Paul's point. Why it has to be understood. The church should be benefited. These gifts are to benefit the church. But Paul clarifies, now I wish that y'all spoke in tongues. Why would he say that? Because he knows it benefits you. Not the church. I wish you all spoke in tongues, not to benefit the church, to benefit you. That's why he says it, right? And then he goes, but rather you'd prophesy, for greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets. Why? Because when you interpret it in the language that people understand, it basically is prophecy. It teaches something, encourages something, exhorts something, comforts something from God. That's so that the church may receive edification. There's the point. That's why I say these nine gifts are all about the body, about edifying, about building up the body, about benefiting the body of Christ. That's what they're for, all of them. Look at verse 18 in the next passage. I'm just going to pull one verse out of there for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. And he says the same thing. Nevertheless, to the church, I prefer to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct others also rather than ten words in a tongue. And you know, tonight I'm going to answer questions and I'm going to tell you what Paul was doing with the Corinthians in a deeper way to help you understand he was instructing a church that was out of order. The last verse in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians says, let all things be done decent and in order. Are you with me? So for the edification of the church and the benefit of the church, Prophecy, anointed, quickened word for a moment to a person or to a group, or interpretation of tongues, tongues interpretation. And the reason that sometimes it's tongues interpretation because the Bible says it's assigned to the unbeliever and also it's all for the believer in two different places. So like for instance, the person that goes, wow, I've had people say, missionaries say that somebody was speaking a language, they thought they knew the language and it was their tongue language and they, somebody came up speaking that language. Someone that I know personally in Des Moines speaks German. His brother used to come in, in the spirit. His brother used to come to church, or his brother does come to church here. <laughs> and let me tell you something. The person came up speaking German. He goes, what are you saying? He didn't know German, but the person understood his word in church was German. That's a real deal. It happens. So I'm telling you, there's a reason why sometimes there's a tongue and interpretation. It's for a sign to somebody. It's a power, it's a convincing people God is real and powerful. All right, then, so I, I wanted you to see the second thing is first to benefit, these gifts are to benefit the body of Christ. But secondly, the baptism with the spirit that Jesus gives us benefits the believer. We're gonna read in Acts chapter one now. And the first thing we're gonna see is that, that it benefits us to be supernatural witnesses, okay? Supernatural witnesses. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented, him to, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. This is the words of Jesus. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John, who baptized in water, said this about Jesus. He said, I baptize in water, but the one that comes after me, I'm not worthy to untie his shoe. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You see, the spirit baptism that overflows with the spiritual language is Jesus' baptism. You see that? That's Jesus, really, is what the baptism of Jesus. And then it says, then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He's worried about the power of the Roman government and the oppression. And now he's, they, they're looking at Jesus as an earthly king to think, well, we've got we to gotta overthrow the Romans. You just get it confused, you know. Listen, when God moves, those things take care of themselves. What we need is a move of God, of God's spirit. 
And Jesus just said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But here's what he was saying, verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witness in Jerusalem. That was at home. That's right here. That's Des Moines area, Iowa. Judea, that's Iowa. Samaria, that's our nation, the United States. And the ends of the earth, that's the other nations. That's why we do nations' missions. And so Acts 2, 1, it picks up and says, the day of Pentecost had come, they were together in one place, Acts 2, verse 1, and suddenly, this like happened to me, suddenly, boom, a sound like a blowing of violent wind came from the heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And suddenly, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came the rest on each of them. And I'm not exaggerating, though it doesn't say suddenly, it's all suddenly. And suddenly, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or enabled them. Another version says gave them utterance. All of them, just like it happened in my church, to the skeptic, to the half Southern Baptist, half assembly God messed up kid. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem and God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They heard this sound, a crowd coming together and bewildered and because each heard their own language being spoken. In this case, it names all the places and there are all kinds of languages and they're hearing them. And what are they doing? It jumps down to verse 11. If you jump down there, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. In other words, they are in a spiritual language that they didn't know the language and they knew they didn't know the language, but someone else was there hearing their own language and they were praising God for the marvelous deeds he had done, other versions say. They were declaring the marvelous wonders of God in their tongues. Some of them thought they were drunk, had too much wine, etc., etc. And then Peter stood up. So what happens? What's the benefit of being baptized with Jesus' baptism? Supernatural power to witness. Let me tell you something. The Spirit, first name is holy. And holiness convicts people. Because God's Spirit wants to give you the fruit, make you holy, to live and look like God. And once you have the witness of your life, now the witness of your words have power. And they impact and they penetrate deep when you speak like a two-edged sword. They cut deep and they convict. And I'm telling you, there is a power. Our world isn't going to change with just, just the facts of the gospel. It's got to have the power demonstration of the gospel with the Spirit of God full throwing through us as we speak it and that we live and that the power of God is upon us. There's supernatural power to be witnesses. Secondly, there's supernatural praise and worship. They were speaking praise and worship and declaring the wonders of God in a spiritual language. We just read it. And then third, there's spirit, supernatural ministry for all. As we pick up reading in chapter 2, verse 14, when Peter gets up and he raises his voice. And in verse 15, he says, these people aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. Verse 16 of Acts 2. No, this is what's spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, miraculous things are going to happen right that's what he's telling them I will pour my spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men that's me will dream dreams I do even on my servants both men and women I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and he goes on and let me tell you something these nine spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit establishes for the benefit of the church are supernatural things in the last days he's still pouring out his spirit and the same thing that happened in Acts 2 happens today and it's to benefit you it's to benefit you. Let me tell you, it happened in Acts 8. It happened in Acts 9. Again, it happened in Acts chapter 10. It happened in Acts chapter 19. All four of those. And you can see if you put those passages right up there. I think there they are. It happened over and over. And over and over, they spoke with tongues and prophesied. One time they don't say that, but Simon wants to buy the power. He saw something happen. He wanted to buy the power so he could lay hands on and make them do that, speak this language. Pretty, pretty. Paul, he was rebuked by Paul because he was trying to, trying to make money, right? So there's a benefit. There's a benefit of, uh, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the believer. Another one is boldness, the fourth one. Peter was afraid of the woman. Like, I don't know that Jesus. You're one of his followers. No, I'm not. You're going to curse before the, the crow, you know, the rooster crows. I don't know him. He's a little bitty girl. You need to, you're one of them. And he has to curse to try to say, I don't know him. And then the crow goes off, or the rooster crows, right? <laughs> now Peter is the one preaching on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit with boldness. And how many thousands of people came to Jesus? And when they say the number, it's only men. Because that's how they were back then. They were sexist because Jesus hadn't set them free from sexism. So they only counted the men, plus their wives, plus the children that were there. Are you with me? 
So I'm telling you, there's a huge benefit. Boldness, authority, power, power to live holy, power to speak, the guiding of the Spirit, knowing what to speak, when to speak, when to be silent. The Spirit of God is so much benefit of being baptized. In other words, not just full in our disciplines, but just to overflowing. Boy, when you get in a witnessing situation, the Spirit's just flowing out of you and truth is coming. And finally, we see the benefits of tongues for the individual believer. Remember, the nine gifts in 12, tongues interpretation is a benefit of the body. But Paul talks plenty about tongues for the believer. All right, first in worshiping in a spirit language. We saw that in Acts 2, right? They were worshiping their spirit language. They were prayer and intercession, 1 Corinthians 14 2. The one that speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God, for no one understands, but his spirit speaks mysteries. It says in Romans chapter 8, about 26, that their spirit makes utterings and groanings, which we, we, we can't do because we're, we're, we're burdened, you know. And, and the spirit, you know, I know I pray the spirit when I'm burdened for something and suddenly my spirit language comes. And I know that God's praying a spirit language as I intercede for people. Prayer, intercession, edification and being built up. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies or builds himself up. Jude, brother of Jesus, Jude 1, there's only one chapter in Jude, verse 17 to 21. And there's a horrible time, much like today, so many people turning from God. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. They're, they're, these are the ones who cause divisions worldly minded devoid of the spirit but you church listen you beloved building yourselves up that's edifying yourself building yourself up on your most holy faith praying in the holy spirit that's spirit language even the armor talks about praying with spirit praying in the spirit and understanding even the armor in ephesians 5 ephesians yeah i think it's ephesians 5 where that's listed Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Listen, as I close and the musicians come, I want to tell you something. I want us to be full of God. I'm going to tell you something. There, and don't misunderstand me. I, I, I got to tell you, in Acts 2, when they're all speaking in spiritual languages, none of, it was, none of it was interpreted. Every time it happened, nothing was interpreted because it wasn't in the setting of the church and, and understood as a message. But when you come to the altar or during worship and you are praying in your spirit language, that's you praying or worshiping. As long as no one thinks you're trying to give a message, there's nothing wrong with that. You see that happening all, the, all over. There's nothing wrong with that. You say, well, I heard someone speaking in tongues. I thought you weren't supposed to do that unless they interpreted. Well, they weren't speaking where everybody in the whole place could hear them so that it demanded an interpretation. They're just praying. Listen, when we have a prayer meeting, you can pray with understanding and you can pray with spirit right? But if you lift your voice and call attention that like it seems like this is a tongue for to be interpreted, now people are going to be confused because everybody stops and listens to you. So you just have to be sensitive. But there's nothing wrong with you and your prayer language. When we're having a prayer meeting, you're up here around the altar. You can just pray in your spirit language. You just have to be okay with it. That's weird. They got that. I don't do that. They do that. I'm glad they do, right? But I'm going to tell you something. You want to be full of the fruit of God, right? Remember love. Right? All of its byproducts, love, patience, all that go with it. You can't look at the, the fruit and get filled with it. You look at the God of the Spirit that gives you the fruit. You get full of God and the fruit naturally grows in the tree. It's the same way with the gifts. You don't look at the gifts, though you're open to them and want God to use you. You don't just look at gifts and go, I want to use, I wanna, I wanna use this gift. I got to use this gift. I, I, I'm going to use this gift. But you can be open, God. I like to be used. And if you have a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, or Lord, you just have a word that flow through me, a pro prophetic word, boy, give it to me. And I, that's all okay. You with me there? Are you here? Right? But mainly, here's what I want you to do. Just ask to be full of God and do all you can do to be Ephesians 5.18 full by your disciplines and by fasting and prayer and the word, praise, you know. Listen, but also as that is full, be open to be immersed to a supernatural like water flowing out of the vessel just starts like a fountain just starts flowing over and that the blessings of God flows through you and people because they're God chooses to use you there's a healing there's a miracle God's spirit says you you I'm looking for a vessel to flow through you in a miraculous way 
say, do I, do I have to speak in tongues? Why would you ask that question if there's a benefit? There's a lot of benefits in there. Why not, God? Lord, I'm okay with speaking in tongues. You gave it to that dummy weaver. You gave it to him, you can give it to me. He wasn't even sure he wanted it. You just poured it on him. I'm here anytime. I'm open. Pour it in. Because that spiritual language is a pretty special thing. It's, uh, it's hard to explain. It's weird. Oh, is it supernatural? Everything supernatural is weird. We're natural beings. Supernatural is weird. Right? I've had the gift of healing flow through me. But I don't, I don't own the gift. It's the spirit gifts. See this right here? I can use a saw. And I can do natural things to do good things. But sometimes I need the power of God. Right? Because there's something that needs to be done more than in my natural spiritual life I can do. More than my hand saw, no matter how good it is and how built up it is and how sharp I sharpen it. Sometimes I need God to hand me a tool, a gift, to get something supernatural done. Are you with me? But this isn't mine. The Father won't get, let you use his tool unless he trusts you that it won't ruin you or hurt anybody else. And there are always stay Holy Spirit gifts. They're not yours. And here, let me prove it to you. You've been used in the gift of healing. I have one time, Holy Spirit gift, Kay Collins. They didn't know what was wrong with her, and they never found out what was wrong, but she got healed. One time, I know the gift of healing flowed through me. I've had other times where I fasted and prayed and people were healed, but I don't think it was a supernatural gift or one of these spirit gifts. But listen. If you have been used in healing and you think that you possess it, you're a healer, then why don't you go heal everyone? You see, severally as he wills, he says, here's this gift for this moment. I want to do a miracle and you're full and you're a vessel like a bright copper wire and I'm going to flow through you with my gift to do something and I'm looking for vessels. You see what I'm saying? So in this moment, as God chooses you separately, he said, I'm going to do the work of faith. I'm going to do a word of knowledge. I'm going to do a word of wisdom. See what I mean? But there's still the Holy Spirit gifts that are not your gifts. How many of you want more, God? Listen, even if you disagree with me on spiritual language, tongues is just an antiquated word for language. Even if you disagree with me, you still want to be full of God, right? Don't you still want God to flow through you? Be careful, you might find yourself speaking in a language. You get full of God, and guess what? You can only get so much water in the vessel before long your bubbles over. Tonight, come back for questions. We're gonna spend a little time, then we're gonna spend time in presence, but will you stand with me as we sing this song? We need a fresh wind, a sound, spirit, sound, rushing wind, fire of God fall within. If you want to say as a, a person of this church, I want to be the first one to say, God, fill me. I want all of you. I want to overflow. I want to see things that I never dreamed possible happen. I want to see my neighbor that's a heathen get saved. I want to see miracle things happen beyond measure. I want to be full of God. Would you come right now as we begin to sing this song? Father God, we open up to you, Lord. We ask you to support your spirit in this place. Lord, let us be open to anything you have, God, to be using your gifts. Lord, to have a spiritual language to worship you, to intercede, God, to pray. Lord, to be freshened and built up in you, Lord Jesus. God, let's flow through us, Lord, as holiness of your spirit brings fruit, God, and that love is so powerful, God. As we look at those that are lost, we see through your eyes, Jesus, and that that love takes the truth and sharpens the sword, and it cuts deep, God, because they don't know what to do with the love. They don't know what to do with the love, and that truth just cuts their heart of their sin and their hardness and their arrogance and their self-will and they what they think is right God break it down God we have relatives we have friends God our nation is so depraved and so confused and so full of self and so so uh, blasphemous against you God we deny who you are Lord we pray against God the spirit of of uh, of uh, uh, of sexual sin, God, of all kinds. We pray, Lord, against the enemy and the demons that would come and confuse people. Lord, we pray against uh, this whole idea of 
of uh, abortions, God, then Lord Jesus, that people would understand life comes from you and then in the mother's womb, you place life and breath, God. We pray in our nation, God, that every believer would be full of you, would go after you, God. We take too many things in that are common, not sinful, but common. We have too many things in that do nothing for our spirit life, God. And I pray, Lord, we start spending more time pouring in the word of your water, the water of your word, and the drink in of your spirit. I pray, God, rise up, Lord. Even as your scripture says, Lord Jesus, let it rise up, God. Let it rise up, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. From the innermost being, as you said, Jesus, let there flow rivers of living water. You said it in reference to your spirit. Let that river of your spirit flow. Let the spirit, God, be upon your people. The power, the anointing in the name of Jesus. And let us be called the people of God that pray. May we be known that we pray first before everything in the morning, before meals, before bedtime, at each meeting, God, that we make prayer central and focused, God. We call on you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, may we eat three meals a day spiritually so that we're strong in spirit. Hallelujah. In your truth and your word, God. Sanctified by your spirit, God. Your word and by your word, God, that is true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.